Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to TFNN. Welcome to the Options Hour. My name is Victor Jones, and for the next hour, we are going to be talking everything options. That's options, options, futures options, um, stock options, equity options, everything um, you know. we want to take a look at here. And obviously, wow, what a day, yeah, not only today, but over the last few days, lots of action that the market is giving us. Um, as a quick market update before we jump into, uh, jump into the program, here, the S&P 500 futures are now trading 1187, almost 1188, um, down only about three dollars. And you can see we've had just a, a pretty sharp rally of about six dollars over the last couple of minutes. Um, the Dow Jones uh, 11478, down 48 dollars on the day. Um, a couple of other, obviously, some commodities, 1698 gold trading, 1698 up $19.70 on the day, crude, 9748 up $0.56. Cents. With that, we want to really just jump into the program here. And if you listened at all yesterday to the quick, uh, quick wrap-up, you heard uh, J.J. Kinahan, our chief uh, derivative strategist, talk just a little bit yesterday about you know, what we're seeing in terms of the market, and obviously with us rallying right now to unchange, and you look at the VIX, and we're trading at $32.10, down $0.81 cents on the day. And, but you know what? Even though we're rallied to unchange, that's pretty much been the story, not only today, but yesterday, obviously not being down on the VIX, but, but you know, in terms of where we were actually rallying, um, you know, we pretty much gapped up on the day yesterday and traded down through the entirety of the day. I mean, we gapped up a little bit higher than 35 and ended the day below 33. And so what I'd like to do for everyone out there is pose this question to you. In, a, in a, over a two-day period, okay, over a two-day period where we essentially have sold off from the basically the 122 area down to 119 in the spiders, and uh, and obviously if you're if you're a futures trader out there, that's uh, that's going to be the 1220 handle in the S and P down to the 1190, or excuse me, the 1195 handle. You know why would we see? Over a two-day move like that, why would we see a VIX that, that is pretty much relatively unchanged? You know, we're at 3183. We're actually lower than we were before we started this uh, sell-off. So for everyone out there, that's just a quick question. Feel free to give us a call. If we could, let's go ahead and post that number right there in the Tiger Den for everyone as well as the international number. But that's a question I want to pose to anyone out there if you'd like to take a quick stab is, over the last two days, what's the theory behind why we would see a lower VIX and we're actually seeing a lower market? As we all understand, typically you see volatility expand as you see a contraction in the actual equities market. So that's a question to everyone out there. And, uh, you know, again, for over the next hour, we're going to be taking your questions. Feel free to give us a call, and we'll go ahead and post that number there in the Tiger Den for you. So one of the things, obviously, that we've been looking at here um, is, is some of these lower price securities. Obviously, the market has pulled back significantly over the last couple of days. We really, I mean, we were standing right at resistance in the 1260 area, and we continued to be there. And you can see we finally pulled off. The market gave up the 12,000 number in the down, the 1260 area in the S&P. I mean, we've also given up the 1800 number in gold significantly in the $99 um, you know, number in crude. We've essentially seen a move off of all resistance areas in these underlying products. We're going to go ahead and jump into taking a few calls here. We've got Ron from Dallas who has some questions on weekly calls. Ron, are you on? Thanks, Victor. I'd like to um, find out about uh, what you think about selling weekly calls and mm -hmm. then covering and then covering them with, say, uh, one or two months out uh, at the same strike price. Yeah, so, so essentially do you have a particular underlying that you're looking at there, Ron? Okay, I was looking at Hewlett Packard most recently, but I'm I'm not I don't have a screen in front of me. I had to go on mm -hmm. another room so you don't hear my my um, computer going. <laughs> no problem at all. So I'll, I'll actually bring it up here. 
So we're looking at Hewlett Packard, and the question is, what are the thoughts? Excuse me. The thoughts around selling the weekly call, basically creating a calendar spread, but utilizing the weeklies instead of the monthly expirations to to basically sell those calls. Is that right, Ron? Right, and then covering them with with uh, a month or two out uh, calls at the same price. At the same yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So essentially, what you're you're giving yourself the ability to do, Ron, is. Um, you know, what you have to be careful of, obviously, is if the market moves just a little bit. For instance, right now in Hewlett-Packard and the volatility there, only about 46%. So the at-the-money strike, I mean, you can literally pin it right now right at 26. So if this was a delta-neutral calendar spread that you were actually putting on, you're selling that front month at 26 at about 50 cents, and then potentially, I'm assuming, either the January or February's is where you're looking, maybe the January's, uh, which is about two expirations out. Is that right, Ron? Right. Okay. So, so essentially what you have the ability to do there is, is as the market moves, as it moves potentially, you have the ability to kind of create some diagonals because you have the flexibility of just a couple of days. What's interesting is you do – um, if you look at the one-week expiration of these Novembers, you're essentially going to get $0.45 cents to sell the 26s. In the back month in December, you're going to get about a dollar twenty. So really, if we extrapolate that from now until December expiration, what does that mean? Well, essentially selling four of these uh, 26 or the, basically the weekly calls, you're essentially going to bring in about $1.60 versus selling out that December 26 call at $1.20. And again, we're, we're already at Tuesday, so you know, obviously this would have been a little bit worth, worth a little bit more um, but we would have been talking about the 27s had we done this yesterday. But essentially, you can see that in utilizing the weeklies, you'll actually capture a little bit more value or premium um, doing that over a four-week period than you would utilizing those December options. So I definitely think uh, you have a little bit more in terms of the role. Um, you're able to collect a little bit more premium in terms of the roll because you can see, again, utilizing this, this brings in actually about a dollar ninety in premium versus the twenty six in December, which brings in a dollar fifteen. So I think utilizing that strategy allows you flexibility in terms of moving the strike around, you know, creating a diagonal spread. If the market moves up, you want to sell the twenty sevens, market moves down, so on and so forth. But you actually, if, if the market sits where you'd like it or you want to continue to roll at the same strike, all things else, you know, all things equal, you'd actually bring in a little bit more premium than selling out the Deces. Oh, okay. Um, how long could you wait to roll that uh, weekly and, and be safe? Uh, could you do it Friday afternoon or? So or what, what happens with these, yeah, that's a great question. So I think what happens with these is you actually see, you know, in terms of the weeklies, you tend to see a little bit more liquidity with these. Um, if we're not talking about, you know, uh, the actual December expiration, obviously in that case you're going to have three weeklies. You might have two weeklies with one actual expiration that acts as a weekly. So in terms of those actual weekly options, you do have a little bit of play in that Friday expiration. Um, excuse me, the Friday of those weekly expirations. But if it's the main month expiration, in other words, you're looking at December and there's only seven days, so those December options are acting like weeklies, you're actually on that, on that Friday going to see those spreads start to widen, widen out quite significantly. And so you might actually look to roll a little bit earlier in those, in those cases. But with weeklies, you, you know, typically you're looking at that Thursday potentially closing out the position, but you still see the liquidity there going into the Friday. Okay, so so get out about Thursday and and on the main month uh, expiration maybe Wednesday or something like that. Yeah, typically on main month expiration you're probably looking at four to ten days expiration, so a little bit earlier in the week. But again, if for your type of play, where you're essentially rolling, 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 you can definitely look at that Wednesday or Thursday to actually move into the next month. And and really you just have to price it out, right? I mean, you know, if uh, you have to, you know, if you're in an, a liquid underlying. And you know that you know the danger is the spread widening out to four cents instead of you know one penny or two pennies wide. That may mean one thing, versus something that, that you're talking about 
the spread widening from four or five cents to potentially ten cents. I mean, that could cost you a lot in terms of giving up edge to roll to the next month. So really, essentially, what you're doing is you're you're um, weighing the underlying liquidity and the options liquidity with with what you might expect in terms of those spreads widening out and what you'll give up in terms of edge. Okay, Victor. Thanks a lot. Yeah, not a problem. That's a great question, Ron. Great question. And I think, thanks for calling, but I think a lot of people tend to actually ask that question. And what have weeklies essentially given you? And you can see in terms of in terms of just you know just premium premium alone you can see that if we extrapolate this over the expiration cycle that we actually do take in a bit more premium utilizing those weeklies than we would with the DS options so we're going to go ahead and take another call we've got Kyle from Orlando who has a couple questions on Amazon yeah I've got an iron condor uh, that was trading nicely in my range until yesterday and dropped out it's climbing back a little today but anyway mm -hmm. I was just wondering what suggestions you had in terms of adjustments when these condors get run away from you? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question, Kyle. So there's a couple of actual things that I could do. If you don't mind me asking, what are the strikes on that iron condor? I've got the on the low is it, put side. Is it December, one, by the way? It's December. Okay. One ninety-one ninety-five on the low side and two forty, two forty-five on the call side. Gotcha. So let's do this. It was 190, 195. We're selling it, buying this. And on the other end, it was two. I'm sorry, 240, 245. Correct. Okay. So buy this. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at it on the analyze tab here for everyone. All right, so uh, clearly, you know, the market sold off a little bit, and now we're starting to come close. We're starting to test, you know, obviously your lower end strike. And so the question is, hey, I'm getting nervous a little bit here about my low end, uh, about the low end of this or my put side of this iron condor, and what potential adjustments do I have? Correct. And so I think what's interesting here is you're actually, we're pretty early in, uh, in the expiration cycle. So what you actually have the ability to do <clears throat> is use a butterfly or a broken wing butterfly, depending on how far you want to adjust, to actually adjust you know, either the put strikes or the call strikes as well. So I'll talk, I'll talk about utilizing just a simple butterfly strategy to roll the put strikes down. And is that something you're familiar with, uh, Kyle? Yes. Okay, so we'll talk about it just really quickly. I think what, what you obviously want to do, and let me ask you before we go into this, is do you remember what you sold the iron condor for? Uh, it was about a buck fifty-eight or so. Okay, so a buck fifty-eight and a five wide condor. Yep, that's a, okay. So about thirty delta. So. Um, in terms of actually use, utilizing the butterfly, you know, you're short. <clears throat> excuse me, you're short the one ninety-five and long the one ninety put. And so if you essentially look at how you could adjust this down or clo just let's just say we wanted to close out the put side of this altogether, the 195 to 190 call spread, you're essentially buying that call spread. And let's say we wanted to, again, put on a new position, what would we, do what would we be doing? Well, we'd be selling another call spread. And so in terms of a butterfly, this might look as follows. We would buy the 195, that essentially closes out the strike. We would sell the 190, which essentially closes out the strike. We sell the 190 again, which opens up a new short position at 190, and we buy the 185, which, is, which would essentially roll us down just a bit to the 185 level. So that's, that's one way that we can use a butterfly to actually roll us down. Well, the question really is here, what strike on the low side are you essentially comfortable with? You know, Amazon has made a low earlier in the year about 177.10. We've turned around. We're now at 187.38. So I've got to ask, we had a little bit of minor support right there at the 190 level. So I can definitely understand kind of maybe essentially why you chose those strikes. If not for Delta, from a technical perspective, there was some support made there earlier in the year, a little bit at the end of July and into August. So I've got to ask, with 177 as the low and obviously potentially providing some downside support, you know, in terms of being comfortable here, what would, what would a downside strike that you might feel comfortable with? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the one 
75, and it, you know, the real support looks like about a buck 65, but mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it'll get there in December. So. Yeah, and I think if we just look, if we just essentially look at uh, at delta only, I mean, if we just look at probabilities here, I mean, the probabilities from where we're trading today, given current implied volatility, the probability that we actually expire below 180 is about 40 percent. The probability that we expire below 175 is about 32 percent. Now, we're so early in the expiration cycle, I you know, in, in a lot of these cases, adjusting the iron condor makes more sense than you know rolling the iron condor obviously to the next month or making some adjustments where you're rolling to the next month. So I do think knowing that delta could tell you the 180 strike is about a 40% chance and the 175 is a 32% chance. Obviously getting to the 165 would be great, but not really going to pay a lot to make that adjustment. So you do have the ability to create you know, close out the 195, 190, and I'll just price this out for you here. Pricing out this move to, <clears throat> excuse me, to buy back the 195, sell the 190, and let's just price out the 180, um, <clears throat> the 180 strike, selling the 180 and buying the 175 behind it. <clears throat> Brings in about you know a dollar fifty to make that roll. Oh, excuse me. Let's say we uh, <laughs> let's try that one more time. We have we still have the calls loaded up here. Buying in the one ninety five, selling the one ninety, selling let's say the one eighty, and buying the one seventy five behind it. You're actually going to be paying a little bit to make that move. So let's just price out the butterfly here. We're at the 190, the butterfly. The butterfly would actually cost right about now. It would cost you about 58 cents to make that adjustment to the downside. So you're going to take 33 percent of the capital to make a move, an adjustment to the downside. Now, the one thing that the one thing we have to say here is that if we look at the overall market here, Kyle. Mm -hmm. The overall market, we had some resistance there at the at basically the 1260 level, and I think we've now made a move. We've now rolled over to past the 1200 level to about the 118 level, and I do think we're going to see a little bit of support here at the 118 level. Um, I don't know if you've if you've got the webcast up, but at the 118 level, it, it's actually a 58 or the 50% retracement from the move of 107 up to about the 130 move. So obviously, you know, we're, we're testing some new support levels here, and I do think you do have the ability to pay the 50 cents. You would now be in an iron condor for about a, a dollar on a five-wide spread. So still pretty good risk-reward scenario there. Um, and I also think we're approaching somewhat of a support level in the market. So if you, if obviously getting down just one or two strikes, that increases your probability by about 18%. It also decreases uh, the capital you're going to take in by 30%. But I do think at that level, from a probabilistic standpoint, we have a high high probability of rallying. And at that point, you can kind of take a look at that adjustment or that roll and see if there's any further adjustment needed to the back month because you'll be a little bit later in the expiration cycle at that time. Right. Right. Okay. All right, Kyle. Well, I appreciate that. Well, thanks for the question. It's a great question. Thanks, Ron and Kyle, both for your questions. And if we do have anyone out there that actually has, um, you know, we want to go ahead and, and touch back on, on the point that we made a little bit earlier, which was the, the S&P 500 now trading 11.89 and a quarter down a dollar and a half. Down a dollar and a half, and the VIX is at 31.98, down 93 cents. So in a day where we've actually sold off a bit, we've actually sold off in the market. Why are we seeing this VIX that is down a substantial amount from a percentage standpoint? And I think the answer there, if we look at it, is is it's kind of simple. We've got this we've got this sort of quote unquote long weekend coming up from us. We're going to be off on Thursday and. And then we've got the weekend right behind it. So the market is tentative to really price up the premiums here. Um, so you've got a lot of people potentially potentially looking at buying buying um, you know buying insurance here. But at the same time, the market is unwilling to kind of to kind of bid those things up because the the more those options cost 
the more time premium is built in. The more time premium is built into those underlying options, the more that, that the uh, I think the market has a tendency to say, hey, I have the ability to sell these options over this long weekend and collect on a lot of that theta or time decay. So it's kind of the same the same thing as you might be thinking in terms of uh, you know Friday expiration or big downside moves on a Friday. You know, it's 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 not that it doesn't happen by any means, but it, it's there's a little bit more resistance to to build in premium into those options when you're going into the weekend. So we've made a move now. You know, we were up a couple of dollars. We are now down four dollars in the S and P 500. And I wanted to quickly talk. You know, when you have this situation in the underlying market where where the underlying market is relatively, you know, relatively soft. Um, and, we, and again, we've we've quickly moved to the 1,200 level, which we thought would provide a little bit of support. We've moved down to the, basically to the 118 level in the spiders. What does that actually mean when you're seeing a declining VIX, and how can you take advantage of it? And I think there's a couple of ways to do that. And, and a couple of the names that obviously we've been watching, and, and the financials have been relatively weak, you know, versus the rest of the market here. And I think just to pull up Bank of America, BAC, I think it's really, really interesting here at these levels, trading $5.38, down $0.11 cents on the day. That's, a, that's another 2% move, basically, for this underlying security. We've got volume here of 160 million shares on the day already so far. And, and, and implied volatility of 92%, basically. You know, the front month's at, a, at 125, but basically that's because we're getting close to expiration. So essentially we've got volatility of about 92%. And what does that mean in, in an underlying security like Bank of America? Well, it essentially means you have an upside potential. You have an upside potential, let's just call it 100%. You have an upside potential, potential for the underlying security to essentially double in price, so $10.60 to the upside, or go to zero. And, you know, if you've, if you've, if you've listened to a few of the guys in our trade desk, and, and, and the question is, from a downside risk perspective, what is the probability that we go to zero versus maybe that the security cuts in half? So maybe you're actually looking at your downside risk in Bank of America at $3 and potentially your upside risk of $10.60. So from a risk-to-reward perspective, this starts to get, this starts to get pretty interesting. And and so the opportunities here are to basically sell puts in the underlying security. If you felt, you know, I've got a better upside potential than my downside risk, if you feel you're basically risking one to make two in this scenario, you have the potential to actually, you know, take advantage of that. And one way that we could uh, <clears throat> look at doing something like that, if we look at return on risk and basically return on capital, the return on risk is telling you, you know, how much risk are you taking in? If you're selling a five a five strike put at let's say twenty cents, well your risk is four dollars and eighty cents. And if you're looking at the capital that you'd actually use to make that trade, so utilizing margin, the actual capital that you'd be using is about, you know, fifty percent of the underlying, so two dollars and fifty cents and then, you know, you're bringing in twenty cents, so about two dollars and forty excuse me, two dollars and thirty cents of capital. So if you actually look at uh, at what your return on capital is for selling the five strike puts here in Bank of America just for December, your return on capital alone is 21.5%. So 21.5% and your return on risk, assuming that you're actually, you know, holding the entirety of that margin is 4.5% for the 24 days. So again, you have the, uh, the ability to collect 4.5% over 24 days here in this underlying security. And the probabilities, the probabilities tell us that, that there's about a 38% chance, in other words, a 62% chance that we stay above the five strike. So basically you have 62% chance you stay above five from now into December, and you're going to make four, or you have the potential to make four and a half percent on that particular strategy in the next 24 days. So, so basically, if you look at what is 10% of Bank of America, well, it's 53 cents. So basically, you have the ability to lower your cost basis by 5%, basically 5% in the next 24 days. You know, and if, and if you end up, you know, taking potentially a long position in Bank of America or you already have a long position, this is one way where you can decrease your potential cost basis in that underlying security, again, 5% over the next 24 days. So I think it's just really interesting the potential 
potential trade strategies that are here and available for you, even though the VIX is not advancing to what, what levels we might think you know, are, are interesting or very rich, rich levels. At the same token, we are approaching a support level in the underlying equities market and we have some of these securities which are giving us a high high volatility. So the overall market volatility is still at 30%. But Bank of America in particular is trading about 93% implied volatility. So how can we look at some of these underlying securities where the risk to reward or basically the upside potential doesn't necessarily match the downside probability? And I think, you know, if we start to look at it that way, if we start to look at what potential opportunities are out there for us in this type of market where we're approaching support, we've had a very, very rapid sell-off of off, off about 30 bucks, $35 over the last two days, we start to see some really, really interesting risk-to-reward scenarios. And in, in this particular case, 4.5% over the next 24 days with a 62% of, you know, probability of success is interesting. I think another more speculative play, and we'll look at a few more financials here in just a bit, but another, you know, another speculative play here is Frontline, FRO. You know, FRO trading $3.10 today. I mean, it's off $2.09, basically off well, a little over 40% today. And again, you can clearly see why this is a little bit more speculative, but what's interesting here, and, and if you're wondering, you know, why it may have slipped you know, basically, it came in with uh, with um, with with uh, third quarter net losses of about 136 million, compared to about 48 and a half net profit for the same period last year. So, uh, but basically, I think the larges were the the losses. Excuse me, were largely attributed to about 120 million dollar impairment charge on uh, on about five of their tankers, three of which they've recently sold. So it's interesting. You have this three dollar security now, which, if you look at the charts, is 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 pretty pretty ugly here. I mean, if, if basically we were essentially trading in a in a six to Basically, the five to six and a quarter range. We're now trading at about three dollars with a low of two ninety seven. But what's what we've noticed here, especially over the last maybe hour or so, is the options activity on Frontline. Um, so if you're looking again, this is ticker symbol F R. <clears throat> excuse me, F R O three dollars and ten cents. But what's interesting here, if we just look at volume and open inches throughout the chain and we start looking at some of the longer-term expiration, you can see, you know, in the May chain, basically there was there's some speculation here at the $6 strike. Two thousand, basically 2,200 calls were traded in the May 2012 six strike. If we go out even a little further. We're seeing in the Jan 13, basically those leap options, 3,100 of those five-strike calls traded today. We're seeing basically three times as much calls being traded in FRO frontline than the puts. And so obviously there's there's pretty interesting opportunity. There's a lot of people out here potentially taking speculative plays. But, but again, um, if we're just looking at – you know, opportunities out there in the market. We go two strikes out, basically the Jan 2014. Today we saw 7,000 calls trade at the five strike in January 2014. So you can see, again, when the market essentially, you know, I don't know if we want to call it overreacting, but it's definitely, you know, the first reaction to this move. We're off over 40%. You know, it's it's the question is how can we how can we take advantage of these things early, and you know again at a at a at a three dollar strike and you look at those three dollar puts from where we're trading at today we're at 186 percent implied volatility, 106 uh, 186 implied volatility so essentially that that at the money put. If, again, you're just looking at return on risk and return on capital, the return on risk here is about 16.5%, and the probabilities here, a little bit less than the Bank of America play, but the probabilities of expiration that we expire below are about 50-50. And, you know, as you go out further, you have the ability to, you know, go a little bit further away from the money for a little bit of security. But I do think what's interesting here. And this very, very low price security is that 
the market has essentially peeled off 40%. The implied volatility has spiked to 180% to the point that the at the money puts are essentially giving you, you know, 120%, excuse me, about a 12% discount on cost basis. So selling those at the money, even if we do sell off a little bit, you've essentially given yourself, uh, given yourself a cushion of, uh, you know, about 15%. So you know, for some of you out there, that might be a little bit uh, <laughs> a little bit more speculative than the Bank of America play. But it's just again, it's something that we're, we're looking at out there, and that uh, you know, it's it's pretty interesting here. Some other higher um, <clears throat> higher liquid names here with a little bit higher implied volatility are Southwest. And you know, from a stock trading perspective, if you look at Southwest, you know, on the charts. You've seen a move from the nine dollar and twenty cent level, it's basically the nine the nine strike, the nine dollar level, and you've seen a low of the seven fifteen. So basically, you know, eight eight dollars to nine dollars has essentially been the range here in Southwest ticker symbol L U V over over basically the last three expiration cycles. We had obviously in the middle of the last expiration cycle, we had a breakdown to the 1750, but you saw it expired, ended up expiring above the $8 level. So, so if you if you're to just simply look at this support and resistance, these buyers and the relationship of buyers and sellers over the last few months, you start to look at what can be potentially interesting here. Again, a very very you know a cheap stock relative to the rest of the market trading seven dollars and sixty eight cents down five cents on the day. Um, that's that's off about you know three quarters of a percent. You know with the volatility here only fifty seven and a half percent. So again, at the eight dollar level, if we're thinking a little bit bullish here in Southwest, if you're thinking. You know, it would be interesting to take these long, long positions here at about this 118 level in the spiders. The eight strike put, you know, if we look at the midpoint, the eight strike put in December is 45 cents at 55 cents. Midpoint being 50 cents. The return on risk for that particular um, for that particular strategy is about six, six and two-thirds of a percent. With the probabilities, again, obviously, if it's an eight-strike put, you know, we're going to have to move about 40 cents to the upside, about a 5% move to the upside. But if you look at essentially where we've traded over the last three expirations, it starts to get kind of interesting because we have had this quick move below $8, and whether or not we, you know, the market continues to move us lower, obviously that's to be seen here. But at the same time, you can see that the market, has historically shown us, at least over the last three expirations, that there are buyers here below this eight strike level, and there's definitely buyers there at the 715 as they took us here higher last time. Just something to keep our eyes on, but again, if we're looking at ways that we can take advantage of higher underlying volatility, higher underlying volatility versus the rest of the market, here when the market's sitting on these support levels, I think it's, there's an interesting long opportunities, LUV being one that's interesting. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Bank of America being another cheap name. And, and Frontline, again, that one being a more speculative play. Again, a lot, you know, we've, we've taken a look at probably 10,000 calls on the long side that were traded today. But those, again, are almost like those kind of those long-term shots in the dark where they're not paying much much time premium to take those underlying, uh, those underlying um, uh, you, you know, speculative plays. We'll look at another here, which I think is interesting and definitely going to definitely going to have a lot of eyes going into this next week. And why is that? Well, we're approaching obviously Black Black Friday. We're approaching a a heavy retail day. So taking a look at XRT as we approach the fifty dollar level, we've broke basically from that fifty four dollar level. Maybe over the majority of the last expiration cycle, we were hanging in that fifty two to fifty four level. We're now approaching the $50 level, and that $50 level has been historical. Basically, it's been historical resistance over the uh, August and, and September expiration cycle, and now we're essentially approaching it again at the $50 level. So we'll talk about an interesting play there in XRT. First, I want to go ahead and take a quick call from Steve in Warren, Michigan. He has a question about iron condors. Steve, you're on the air. Yeah. Hi, Victor. Um, my question is relating to the uh, – Probabilities when setting up an iron condor. I've been sure. kind of looking into 
uh, different criteria. And I, I read something interesting that somebody talked about uh, set it up with a uh, 50 to 70 percent uh, probability of success. And then later they said that uh, more experienced people would rather might rather set it up with around 80 or 85 uh, percent of uh, probability of success. It seems kind of backward to me. Could you maybe give me some uh, insight on that? Yeah, I would actually I would actually argue the opposite, Steve. I would argue that, you know, in terms of when it comes to iron condors and and, and when it comes to more experience, I think there's some ways to play iron condors. In other words, if you if you're in a range bound market and you feel comfortable not only legging into the market but legging out of the market, you know, there's some there's some opportunities there if you're going like a 50-50 route in a market you feel very comfortable that's pretty range bound. As the market rallies, you you might look to take off the put spread and as the market maybe maybe peels back a little bit taking off that call spread. So Essentially, in those cases, you're not looking for an expiration play. You're looking, again, just for the market to give you the opportunity to get out of each side in a profitable manner. On the flip side of that, Steve, the argument for what they may be talking about is, is a more experienced trader. If, if the market sells off, okay, let's say a, a market is oscillating between 50 and $52. Okay. okay, and we're at fifty-two dollars, and the market sells off down to fifty. And I feel comfortable selling a put spread right at the fifty strike as we as we come off to the fifty-dollar mark. Now, as the market rallies closer to fifty-four, again, I'm not putting on an iron condor; I'm lagging in. As the market rallies, as we get closer to fifty-four, I might put on the call side. So essentially. <clears throat> Any other trader in that market, they might put on the iron condor at the same time, which might give them a 70% probability of success. Whereas someone who might understand that market or is, under, or is very comfortable lagging into an iron condor, they got better prices on both the put and the call side, which essentially, if you're getting better prices, is going to give you a better probability of success than someone who puts that iron condor on altogether. So the only argument I can potentially make for that is if they were actually talking about potentially legging into that, uh, legging into the iron condor. Okay, then if if you were going to just just say you felt uh, the market was going to stay about where it is, mm -hmm. if you were just going to put an iron con uh, iron condor and you had a neutral perspective for the time being. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of probability would you would you shoot for setting that up then? What would you, what yeah. would you like? That's a great question, and I think in a lot of times when you're putting on, it's a little bit different than when you're putting on a vertical spread. When you're putting on a vertical spread, I'll probably look for the 30 delta options, but when you combine a vertical spread on both the downside and the upside, you end up with about a 33% chance of probability of success. So if you actually okay. look for maybe the 15 delta options and you combine those together, you end up with about a 70% probability of success. And so one quick way to basically do the math behind this is um, on the Thinkorswim software, we have the, instead of looking at Delta, we have the probability of expiring numbers. Yes. So you can essentially utilize those numbers and maybe look for anywhere around a 50 to 20% probability of success. And you'll, you'll essentially know by how wide your uh, how wide your spread is versus how much you're taking in. You know, if you're taking in 30 cents on a one wide iron condor, just for ease, easy numbers here, uh -huh. you're taking in 30 cents. If you're one strike wide, you have 70 cents of risk, right? Because one dollar right. minus 30 cents is 70 cents. So you take your real risk, 70 cents, and you divide it over the strike width, and there's your probability of success, which is 70%. So okay. one thing you can do is actually use the price that you're receiving for the iron condor versus the uh, width of the strikes, and that'll give you a good idea of what the probability is. And so that way you can price it out, um, you know, and you wouldn't, you know, if you're not using the software, you're not using, you're maybe on your mobile software, whatever the case is, the, the, the actual price of the underlying condor will tell you everything you need to know about the probability of success. Okay, sounds great. Yeah, thanks for the call, Steve. It was a great one. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, so, you know, again, Steve raises a great point, and we're talking about a potentially range-bound market here um, in, in XRT. You know, we're talking about we're approaching this, uh, you know, this, this, you know, pretty large day here in, on Friday, and I think the expectation is 
you know, people are going to be pretty conscious, pretty conscious of their spending. They're not going to over leverage themselves. But you know, if we look at everything that's going out on there from a political level when it comes to Occupy Wall Street and the kind of movement that's going on there, I think people are going to be a little bit conscious of of their spending habits and their spending levels here into uh, into uh, you know Black Friday. But I also I also think that. Um, I mean, you know, and it's out there, a couple of articles and things like that. People, you know, the brick-and-mortar stores, don't be surprised if you don't see them as full, but the numbers don't come back as, you know, bad as you think, because I think a lot of people are going to have, have already and will continue to migrate to online shopping, especially in the environment that we have today. So what I think is, is potentially interesting here is we sell off to the, to the 50 level here in XRT, Keep in mind where we are in terms of support. I think the higher end retailers have have tended over the last couple of, of earning cycles to actually hold their value better than the overall retail market. So you've got things, you know, underlying securities out there like, you know, Tiffany's, um, Coach, you know, we've got these underlying securities that are actually these higher-end retailers, which may hold their value from a retail perspective, a little bit uh, a little bit better than some of these, um, you know, some of these general retailers. So I'll put in Tiffany's. Uh, I'll give a excuse me. I'll give a quick price update on Coach, trading fifty nine ninety nine, up twenty cents on the day. So we're trading right at sixty dollars, which again, if you look back in September expiration, was was a pretty heavy resistance area. So I think what's what could be interesting here, <clears throat> and you know I, I think somewhere around 55 is about the midpoint in Coach and their range over the last few months. You've basically seen a range from 55 to 65. So twenty dollars in the middle, or excuse me, ten dollars in the middle is about 55 dollars. So if you look at COH or Coach, you look at their underlying options. Basically, they're priced at about 45% implied volatility going into December. And you look at those, uh, you look at the 55 strike puts versus, you know, the 55, 52 and a half puts, you take in 40 cents. You basically take in 40 cents on two and a half dollars of risk. So, you know, if we analyze that uh, from a probability perspective, We'll just set our slices to break even. You analyze that, that's about a 76% probability of success. In other words, a 76% chance that we expire above the break even, which in this case is $54.58. So again, a 50% retracement of their move over the last three months would be about $55. In addition, you have this support level at the 57 and a half, or this perceived support level at this 57 and a half right behind the $60 mark where we're sitting right now. So we've talked, you know, so far, man, we've talked about a lot of underlying securities, obviously a couple of retailers, a couple financials. I want to give a quick market update. We've had some great questions here today. For all of you who uh, who want to go ahead and, and call in a question, feel free to do so. Uh, you can reach us at 877 877- Nine two seven six six four eight. That's live, live number eight seven seven nine two seven six six four eight. All the international people out there, if you're joining in from Europe, you want to know what's happening in the U.S. market. Seven two seven four four five ten forty four. Again, this is TFNN and the Options Hour. Giving a quick market update here. Eleven eighty eight even down two and three quarters um, on the. On the S and P, on the Dow, we're 11,482 down 43 dollars on the Dow. The VIX 3207, we're approaching the 32 dollar mark, down 84 cents on the day. Gold 170210, up 23 dollars and 50 cents. So quite a move in gold. So so you're actually seeing. You're actually seeing a, a really interesting kind of return. I don't want to say return to normalcy, but what was happening? <clears throat> excuse me. What was happening? When gold was at the 1800 level, remember when we would have these $20 down days, when we would have these sell-offs. Did you actually? We wouldn't actually tend to see the move in gold, or that inverse relationship that to the gold market that we might tend to often see. But what we would see is a spike in the VIX up to 40%. So in other words, people in those cases were buying insurance versus switching from from the equities market to the commodities market. 
So again, and what you're seeing here is that as as you know, as we approach this kind of long weekend, there's a hesitancy to buy up options, and there's instead. <clears throat> Since we've had this peel back in gold off the 1800 level down to the 1700 level, you know, we basically touched 1625 and now we've retraced up to the 1702 level. You're seeing people, it's, it's kind of a mixture of, uh, you know, overextension in the gold sell off in addition to, you know, you have a 35 move in the equities market and you feel you can't buy up options for insurance, what would you do? Well, you, you're starting to see some people utilize that gold market as a potential equity hedge. Looking at gold as well. Want to take a quick move, or excuse me, look at gold. It's had a sharp turnaround here, and uh, you know we've we basically broke a hundred. I mean, we broke a hundred into the one hundred three level, and now we've sold off sharply into uh, basically sub ninety six level before rallying to ninety eight eighteen. And if you remember, just a couple of just a couple of weeks ago, we were sitting right at the ninety. We basically broke ninety eight. We were approaching the ninety nine dollar level. We looked at essentially what was available in terms of those of those crude options, and we noted that the basically the one hundred two level on the upside calls, you know, gave you a very very good probability of success. And even though you would have taken some heat on the upside, you can see in terms of expiration where we're looking and where we're setting ourselves up to, for December is going to be very, very interesting. Um, well, again, we'll quickly jump into, I know we talked about Coach, ticker symbol T, or excuse me, COH. I want to quickly mention Tiffany, which has a very, very similar uh, technical pattern. So we'll show... We'll show this here. As we approach the $80 level, we essentially hung in that range of $75 to $80, and we're now breaking that range. And if you look what happened basically in August to September expiration, you're seeing this, this basically this kind of head and shoulders formation that formed. Um, and you saw a basically a break from that head and shoulders neckline of about the $66 level down to $56, so about a $10 move. So if you take <clears> – <throat> A ten dollar move to the to the downside, and you add it to that neckline to the upside. You know, seventy six dollars. That's exactly where that upside, uh, the basically the head of the shoulders, the distance between the shoulders and the neckline was. So you actually saw that inverse relationship, and you kind of almost saw the the exact opposite, a reverse head and shoulders that formed in Tiffany. I know this is the options hour. You could you could get confused. This is actually we're given a nice technical breakdown. So between between that move from from the neckline to the upside was about ten dollars uh, from seventy one to eighty one. So you're seeing kind of that that very very interesting or symmetrical pattern here in in Tiffany's and a bit of volatility from fifty six up to eighty. So what does that potentially give us? Well, we know that there's a little bit of support there around the 65, maybe even 67 and a half level right around that neckline from before. So again, if we're thinking that this is an interesting place to start taking some long positions, at least start looking at, you know, if you're if you're net short looking at, uh, you know, diversifying into basically what's going to be a heavy retailer week or heavy moves into the next week's retailing, you know, <clears throat> This uh, this sixty seven and a half sixty five put spread in Tiffany's is is somewhat interesting. At two and a half dollars wide, it pays sixty cents. The probability on that, from an analyzation, from an analyzed standpoint, <laughs> is about sixty nine or seventy percent. So you're seeing an overall theme here in some of the underlyings that we're talking about. And typically, we're always looking for opportunities that give us a high probability of success. The underlying market here in Tiffany's is $72.5, and we're positioning ourselves to be successful anywhere from here down to $67. So basically, we've given ourselves $5.5 of breathing room here on any long positions, which is something you really have to carefully consider here going into which should be interesting numbers um, and interesting reports here on, on Friday. 
So with that, let me go ahead and quickly wrap up on, on all the topics that we've, that we've kind of talked about here today with some great calls from Ron, Kyle, and Steve. Um, and we, we appreciate that. We discussed weeklies. We discussed Amazon and adjusting your iron condors. Warren in Michigan, or excuse me, Steve from Warren, Michigan, asked a couple of questions about, you know, how do we appropriately decide what, uh, you know, what call and put spreads to utilize as we're, as we're contemplating putting on those iron condors. We've also talked about a few underlying securities here today, Bank of America, and what that potentially pays out in terms of selling those uh, in terms of selling those puts against risk and also against uh, your capital. We've talked about uh, LUV, that's Southwest Airlines, at seven dollars and sixty-eight cents. We've talked from a technical perspective what that eight dollar, what that eight dollar range actually means, or that eight strike range means going into December. We've also talked about FRO. Again, a very, very speculative play, but 180% implied volatility. It just presents an interesting an interesting risk-reward scenario. Obviously, if something has 200% um, implied volatility, it can go two times as high or one time as low. So it just, again, you can kind of see why some of, some of those people are taking basically 10,000 of those calls or trading in those, in those longer-term expirations. Because if somebody tells you that an underlying stock can move two times as high or one time as low, you have an interesting risk-to-reward scenario there. Again, we've talked about some of the retailers. We've looked at XRT, and I think that's it's a tough one to put on a position into into this Friday. And the only reason I feel that that's potentially the case is because I think there's a different level of retailers here. Obviously, we know there's high-end retail. And, uh, you know, there's the Walmarts and Targets of the world. But I also, I also think those are going to perform differently going here into, uh, into uh, the, you know, the holiday season. So I think it's important, obviously, XRT, if you have some, you know, we're approaching a very, very uh, heavy support level. At the same time, I think you have to be very, very careful. So I think uh, in terms of retailers, there's those high ends that we talked about in terms of Coach, which offers an interesting level at the 55 to, to potentially sell puts or put spreads. And there's also TIF, Tiffany, which offers an interesting 67 and a half, 65 put spread. So, folks, that has been the entire hour. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And, again, meet us right here, same time, same place, TFNN and the Option Hour. Thanks, everyone. Have a great uh, holiday.